You know, I, uh, it's interesting when you get an opportunity to speak. So many people uh, come and give you so much uh, encouragement. Amen. And, uh, you know, I appreciate that so much. Uh, brothers came up to me before I came up here today and uh, told me to uh, let it rip. Uh, I was told to uh, lay you out. And I was told to bring the sword and to cut you up into little bitty pieces. Oh, what have you guys done? <laughs> One brother told me to bring the hammer. I'm like, these are God's people. They don't need the hammer today. You know, it's uh, so awesome to hear Cash Bar and Ashley's communion. Wasn't that uh, incredible? Such a blessing when somebody gives you their testimonial and... Yeah confesses their sin. I'm not sure why she hated Europe so much. Uh, but I'm glad the Lord got on in there. But, you know, what it reminded me of is that, uh, you know, God wants our all. Yeah. And, uh, you know, sometimes we want to give God 90% and that's not what God wants. He doesn't want the 90% you're giving, although he accepts it and takes it. He wants the 10% that you holding back. Yeah, that's true. He don't want your 95. He wants the five that you keeping for yourself. Do I have to be nice today or can I just lay it out? What does me hold back anyway? Man, I have so much to say. Come on, brother. I don't even know where to begin. I'm just going to let the Spirit do what the Spirit does. I do want to say good morning to you. I, I want to welcome all the visitors that are here today. Let's give our visitors... I'm so thankful for two of our BFFs, R.D. and April Baker. Uh, we have some new friends that God has brought into our life. Jesseline and Debbie are here. Uh, so very, very much. You know, I, I appreciate my runner. Kobe's uh, been my runner all weekend, and I've never seen him. Oh, 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 oh. I told Kobe he's my new grandson in the faith. I said, if I didn't love you, I wouldn't talk trash about you. All right, come on, buddy. <laughs> but I love Kobe. I renamed him. Yeah. Uh, he's no longer Kobe Gray. Okay. He's now the White Mamba. Hey. <laughs> I love my White Mamba. <laughs> Preach. I thought Anthony did an amazing job yesterday. Yeah. Love Anthony and Cassidy so much. Anthony is an amazing brother. I've renamed him too. I just call Anthony the kid. Anthony the kid. The kingdom kid. The kid on the rise. The kid of the future. We love you so much, bro. Thank you for your amazing, amazing message. And then our mom and dad in the faith all over the world, Kip and Elena McKay. So grateful that God has uh, brought him and I back uh, to be with Kip and Elena. Uh, Kip's my discipler. He's my teacher. He's my mentor. He's my leader. Amen. And I'm so proud to uh, be under your tutelage, your spiritual care, uh, and to have you as a very, very dear friend. Thank you so much. I love you very, very much. And then I want to also.
also thank the whole London family for having me here. In 95. But a brother came up to me, he said, I'm tired of that alive in 95 stuff. Come on. He said, Well, let's get something new. Why don't you why don't you make 2018 dream in 2018? Come on. And I said, that's alright, but it seems like they've been walking around dreaming in 2017. It's time for London to get his hands out of the clouds. They told me to rip you up. <laughs> but I'd like you to consider a new thing. I agree. Alive in 95 is old and dated. That's gone and done. We need to move on to some new things, right? So I told Michael, I said, you know, I know this is your church and you're doing the whole region, but can Big Papa make a recommendation? Come on. <laughs> Maybe 2018 for the London church needs to be great things in 2018. Now Satan doesn't like that. He wants your theme to be, be mad and make Satan glad. Be lazy and drive God crazy. Or stay the same and live in shame. Oh. I need somebody in here to pull out their phone and hashtag great things in 2018. Can we for all parazim great things in 2018? Yeah. Can we John 14, 14 great things in 2018? I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I've been doing. He will do greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. When we don't do great things, the Son doesn't bring glory to the Father. I need somebody to start printing the hats right now. Okay. GTI 2018. Oh, come on. Or the t-shirts. Who's gonna print the t-shirts? Where are the bracelets? The temporary tattoos to put on the kids' cheeks. It's time for all of London to know that the LA. Uh, that the, the London church is here. Yeah. It's time for great things in 2018. I love the conference title, Conquering Kingdoms. Yep. But I had to change the title of my sermon because there's something missing in that title. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. I'll let you know what my sermon title is in a little bit. Because I want to go right into the Holy Scriptures. So that the Holy Scriptures can go right into you. Come on. Hebrews chapter 11. Let's go, bro. Let's go. Hebrews chapter 11. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Say amen when you get there. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 1. Amen. Our theme scripture for this conference is the chapter on faith. So we better talk about some faith today. Oh, yeah. Now, I'm going to read about their faith, but I really don't want to talk about their faith today. I want to talk about your faith. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. Verse 4. By faith Abel offered a better sacrifice than Cain. Verse 5. By faith Enoch was taken from this life. Verse 6. And without faith it is impossible to please God. Right. Somebody needs to say amen. amen. Yeah. Verse 7. By faith, Noah, in holy fear, 
built an ark to save his family. Amen. How far are you willing to go for your family? Come on, preacher, brother. Verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went. Come on, John. Verse 20. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau regarding their future. 21. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, Bless Joseph. 23. By faith, Moses' parents hid him for three months. Amen. That must have been really challenging to hide a baby for three yeah. months. Yeah, right. yeah. Yeah. Verse 29. By faith, the people passed through the Red Sea as on dry land. Amen. By faith. Amen. Verse 30, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell after the people marched around them for seven days. Come on. By faith, the prostitute Rahab, because she welcomed the spies, was not killed with those who were disobedient. And what more shall I say? I do not have time. You know, this, this, this writer of Hebrews is looking at the clock like a preacher. Not like you. <laughs> he says, my problem is not that I don't have more examples of faith or that I've run out of examples of faith. I've run out of time. Wow. Now we're at the end of our conference. And we've almost run out of time. We've got a little bit of time left. It's been an amazing conference. Amen, brother. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to talk about two types of faith today. We can read about their faith. Let's talk about your faith. Today. Come on. Come on, bro. Point number one, a faith that trusts in God. Point number two, a faith that triumphs over trials. Come on. Come on. If you have your faith any amount of time at all, you're going to have to triumph over some trials. How many of us are facing yep. trials right now? Hey. Don't be ashamed about it. Brother, raise your hand. I just... <laughs> <laughs> Before we look at that, we've got to understand a couple of things. Come on, call them out, everyone. We need to understand, first of all, that there is a can't do in your life. Oh, I know you think you can do everything. Oh, no. Oh, no. There's some can't do's in your life. The first can't do in your life is that you can't conquer kingdoms by yourself. That's right. There's some amazing people in this audience. Some of you are so talented, you're so bright, you're so hardworking, you're, you're on, educated, Denzel. you're committed, on, you're Denzel. devoted. Few of you are even fairly good looking. There's some can't do's in your life. I appreciate all the incredible people we have in the kingdom. I appreciate you, Princeton. Yuri the Fury, you're awesome. There's some cat dudes in your life. Cassidy, Rebecca, Michelle, Michael. I love you, but there's some can't do's in your life. Oleg. Where's Oleg? Oleg. Oleg. That one. I love you, but there's some can't do's in your life. Man, I'm a check. There's some can't do's. You can't conquer kingdoms without God. I don't even know this person. I just like their name. I saw it in the program. She's my sister, though. Natasha Chadula. Oh, You've got 
the best name in the kingdom of God. <laughs> but you can't do it. But what you can't do is conquer kingdoms by yourself. By yourself. Come on. Yeah. Come on. Bro. I want you to notice something profound in Hebrews chapter 11. Talk right. to us, brother. Come on, bro. Lay it out. It's so very important. It screams out of here. And that is, there is a by faith listed in front of every person. A by faith in front of every story. Yeah. A by faith in front of every miracle. Amen. Come on. In the Bible, if there isn't a by first, by faith first, there won't be a miracle. Wow. 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 Come on, bro. Come on. Come on, bro. If there isn't a by first in front of it, there won't be a miracle behind it. Some of us have been going out in our lives without our by first. Without our by faith first. We've been trying to do God's work with our faith in the back. God says, no, no, no. You put your by faith in the front. Wow. That's right. Come on, brother. So, so what's the title of my sermon? Conquering Kingdoms by Faith? No. 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 By faith. By faith. Oh. Conquering Kingdoms. Oh. It's time for some by faith in Europe. It's time to kick our by faith into action. Uh -huh. You know, I appreciate you guys hosting the 2012 Olympics. You did an amazing job. Come on. They weren't my fire up at all. You know, but in Olympic sports, the long distance runners have a very unique quality. Yeah, they do. And I don't know if you've ever on, noticed that the <laughs> world-class runners have what they call kick. Yep. Yeah. yep. And, and kick is a technical term for the, the, the world-class runners and the, the athletes that when the race gets to a critical point, when it gets to the heart of the race, when it's the most important, that athlete is able to reach within themselves yep. Yep. and pull out speed yep. that nobody has seen yet. Yeah, that's right. And they turn it on in the last lap. They're in the pack. And everybody's running in the pack. And then kick yes. kicks in. Oh, yeah. And kick pro propels that athlete out front. Yep. And that athlete sprints no, around, and then another athlete that wants to win sees that athlete kick, kick in, and their kick kicks in. Yeah. <laughs> Who's faith gonna kick in first Come in on, Europe? Oh, yeah. Come on, we need somebody to decide today. My faith is about to kick in. We need somebody's eyes to light up. And get inspired and say, it's time for my faith Come on, to kick in for God. Come on. And then I believe others will follow you. Faith that trusts God. You know, when you're looking to define things, and I, I love the Hebrews 11 definition of what faith is, being sure of what we hope for, and confident of what we do not see and that is so true i hope you're sure of the hope that you have for heaven i hope you're sure and confident about the promises that we have in christ amen church amen. but you know a lot of times we'll go and we'll look at webster's as well and we'll get webster's dictionary uh, can i just say something i don't think webster is very spiritual <laughs> i'm starting to really develop some attitudes about webster we we, we might want to ban Webster's definitions as it applies to spiritual things. Yeah. <laughs> you know, other things, okay, but, but you know, I just, I just looked it up and, you know, I thought, well, what is Webster's belief about faith? And it says complete confidence, 
It says belief in the doctrines of religion. Wow. And I'm like, that that's pretty lukewarm there, Webster. Yeah. <laughs> I want to spend a little time talking about some properties of faith. Come on. Come on, John. Talk to us, brother. I've spent the last 30 years of my life being devoted to understanding faith. These are just some things that God has helped me to learn and understand. I actually realized that my faith had gone uh, to another whole level right here in London, walking up and down the Thames River. Number one, faith is belief with some bad neighbors. Faith is belief with some bad neighbors. You know, when Em and I moved into our new place, it was awesome at first. Uh, it was just me and her, and I was on a, we were on a, a little bit of a sabbatical, and nobody was coming over to the house. And uh, then Kip and Elena brought us on staff, gave us people to lead, and, and now our neighbors hate us. Um, they're upset because our friends from church come over all the time. Uh, they don't like all the praying that goes on in our place. Uh, they don't like us singing. Um, they don't like us talking about Jesus to them the way we do. Uh, and, and Christians are, are noisy too, right? Yep. Yeah. 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 If you're a quiet Christian, just repent. <laughs> They've even started like putting notes on our cars. Your car shouldn't be here more than an hour. It's just totally illegal stuff. Really, really mean stuff. Bad neighbors. But faith has some bad neighbors too. Faith's bad neighbors are unbelief, doubt, insecurity, fear. Faith is not the absence of fear. That's right. In fact, one of the most frequently used phrases in the Bible is do not be afraid. Yeah. Yeah. I'm scared of rabbits. I'm going to tell you the story behind that. Come on. Come on. That's the story. <laughs> but, but faith, faith is not the absence of fear and doubt. Turn over to Mark chapter 9. I want to show you one of the most awesome prayers, I think, in all the Bible. Mark chapter 9. Come on, John. Come on, John. Are y'all fired up? Mark chapter 9. I'm going to bring the hammer on you if you're not. No, we're ready, man. Bring it. Look in, um, we're not afraid, look in bro. verse 24. Mark 9, 24. Immediately the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. I thought you just said you believe. Right. You see, you can believe and still need help overcoming your unbelief. Why? Because faith has bad neighbors. I wonder today if anybody in here has prayed this prayer in the last 24 hours. How many of you could use a prayer like this in your life? How many of you have prayed this prayer for someone else in the last 24 hours? How many of you know someone that could use a prayer like this? God help that person overcome their unbelief. What this prayer says is that 
without God and praying to God, my faith isn't what it could be. And I want to challenge us here in Europe to pray this prayer for ourselves and for others every day. Amen, church? Yeah. Amen. You have to believe something before you can have faith in it. You know, there are escalators in this hotel. You have to believe if I step up on this escalator, it'll be able to hold me up. If not, you'll circle around and you'll take the stairs, right? You know, faith is the same way. If you don't, if you don't believe it, you'll choose something else. You'll rely on yourself. Let me give you my definition that, that I've written up. I think it's better than Webster's. Right. It's the best definition I can come up with. Faith is belief plus fear, unbelief, insecurity, doubt, waving at you in your neighborhood right next door. Asking. Can I come over your house? And you say no. And then you act on the part of belief. Faith and belief is taking action now. You know, sometimes we can think that living by faith is saying that is it, staying over in the belief column until we're 100%. Wow. That's not living by faith. No. That's stalling by faith. Oh. Oh. Wow. Number two, your faith isn't forever. Oh, I know you put a lot of work in it, but, but it's, not, it's not forever. You can't take it with you. Why? You don't need it. You won't need it where you're going. Look over at 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. Oh, John. In verse 8, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you're receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Faith has a goal, and that goal is heaven. And that's where we're going, right? Yeah. So your faith isn't forever. Your faith has a finish line. Your faith is for right now, today, for you, against Satan, for, for the friends that you want to baptize, for the battles that you've got to fight. God wants us to use our faith up in this lifetime. Come on. Come on. You know how many of you, if someone that you didn't know just decided every day for the rest of your life they would put 86,400 pounds into your bank account wow. every day Come on. Oh, come on. with a couple stipulations you got to spend it all every day or your bank account will be empty that night what would you do every day? You would spend it, right? Come on, yes. You would use it all. Michael, love, everywhere. Hopefully you give it all the missions, too. Whatever's left. Well, every morning and every day, you get a deposit of 86,400 seconds. Right. Wow. God deposits 86,400 seconds of time every day in your life. The end of every day, what you don't use is withdrawn. It's taken off the books. You can't transfer it. There's no overdraft protection for it. You snooze, you lose. What are you doing with your time? Oh, God. Oh, you were happy when we talked about those British pounds. 
But what about your time? Come on. Come on. Come on. Your faith isn't forever. Number three, faith comes in small packages. Look over in Romans chapter 3. I'm sorry, right. Romans chapter 12. Faith comes in small packages. The Bible says in Romans 12 and verse 3, For by the grace of God given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought to. But rather think of yourself with sober judgment and accordance with the measure of faith you have been given. Everybody here has been given a measure of of faith. The Bible talks about uh, in Matthew 17 that that measure is a mustard seed. It, it describes the amount of faith that we get with, with the mustard seed. Now mustard seed is according to the Jewish encyclopedia one of the smallest seeds. The actual size is the size of a pinhead. Look at the end of your pen that you're writing with. That's the size of a mustard seed. You've been given pinhead faith. <laughs> That's funny. That's all you got. It's pinhead faith. How grateful are you for the faith, the measure of faith that you received? That seed of faith is a seed with a huge tree inside. Mm, wow. It's the largest of all garden plants. Do wow. you realize that most of the miracles in the New Testament were done with mustard seed faith? Pinhead faith. People that had their first encounter with Jesus the first time. The centurion had pinhead faith. Blind Bartimaeus had pinhead faith. The paralytic, the bleeding woman, and on and on and on. If that's what pinhead faith is able to accomplish, what's your faith doing? Yeah, come on, brother. Come on, John. I suggest to you that our faith is underperforming in this room. Come on. Some of us have known Jesus for many, many years. You don't have pinhead faith anymore. That's right. You have plant faith. Wow. But what are you what is your faith doing for God? How much are you allowing God to use your faith? Faith yeah. comes in a small packet. Your faith should be growing fast. Mark chapter 4, verse 33. The Bible teaches that our, our faith goes from a seed and then it becomes a plant. When you plant a mustard seed, you put it in a, a small six-inch hole and you fill the hole up with water. In 42 hours, the seed bursts open. And a plant starts emerging and budding out. Amen. Most of us in this room have plant faith. There, there are a couple trees in here. I think Kip and Elena are trees. I think Justine and Debbie are probably trees too. There's a couple of trees in here, but most of us, most of you are just plants. <laughs> I just told you what seed faith can do. Imagine what plant faith should be doing. Amen, brother. Your faith should be growing. James chapter 2, verse 5 says that God wants us to be rich in faith. Some of us are trying to be rich in wealth. God wants you to be rich in faith. Rich. 1 Thessalonians, Paul says to the Thessalonians, your faith is known all over the world in chapter 1. By 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he says that I see that your faith is growing more and more and more. How do you go from your faith is known all over the world to I see your faith is still growing more and more and wow. more? Wow. Come on. Your faith should be growing rapidly. It's interesting about faith because it also grows in some of the most non-optimum situations. Yeah. You ever seen a, been walking down the street and you, you, you come to a sidewalk or a parking yeah. lot of concrete and, and right in the middle of it there's a plant just sticking its head <laughs> on yeah. it. Like, you guys see me? 
You know, faith is like that in, in the most difficult situations, and this is when faith is the most inspiring. It just burst out and says, I'm alive. Some of our faith needs to burst out in this room this year. Come on. Come on, John. Declare that it's alive. Yes. I want to get down to some more serious things now. All right. Come on, John. Faith has to fight to survive. Yeah. Look over in 1 Timothy chapter 1. It's hammer time now. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, John. I'm so glad y'all are feeling good about yourselves. But let's look into our heart at some things now. Come on. 1 Timothy chapter 6. Come on, John. Look down in verse 10. Bring the heat. Faith has to fight to survive because it can wander away. Yes. Verse 10, for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. That's right. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. You know, the desire and the love for the world can cause you to wander yeah. from your faith. That's right. Yeah. And it's a slow death. Oh, yeah. Yeah. How many of you in this room are being drawn to the world? Come on, bro. That's that. Some of you, you're experiencing a slow death right, right now. Right. You're hanging around the malls a little bit more now. You're giving a little bit less. You're watching all the financial shows a little bit more on television. Right. You're drawn to the wealthy people in your society. You have such an ambition to have more and more and more. God doesn't want you to be rich in money. God wants you to be rich. Faith. faith has to fight to survive because faith can be shipwrecked. First Timothy chapter one. Faith can wander. Faith can also be shipwrecked. Verse 18. Timothy, my son, I give you this instruction in keeping with prophecies once made about you. So that by following them, you may fight the good fight. Tell me we don't need discipling in our lives and instruction. Paul says, holding on to the faith and a good conscience. Some have rejected these and have so shipwrecked their faith. Come on. I don't know if you've ever seen pictures of shipwrecks, but, but I've never seen a shipwreck where there was just a little bit of damage. Right. Right. Yeah. Most of the time when you see a shipwreck, I mean, it's tore up. Yeah. Yeah. The, the ship has a big hole in it. Yeah. it. It can't float anymore. It's damaged beyond repair generally. Yeah, right. yeah come on. Wow. And Paul tells Timothy in their discipling time, be careful that you hold on to the faith, that you fight for the faith with a clear conscience. Come on. How open are we right. yeah. about our lives? Yeah. Come on. Some of us in here today, we violated our conscience, and nobody knows about it. Right. Wow. The places we've been, things we've done, We don't have a good conscience anymore because nobody knows about it. Preach. Preach, bro. Let's end that today. Preach it, brother. It may be that God is just not blessing his church here because of your bad conscience. It might be your fault. You going to do something about it? Some of you... You, you need to race to the first 
disciple you see after this lesson. Don't do it right now. Come on. <laughs> hey, bro. You just need to get over it. You need to get your conscience right. Yeah. Faith can be shipwrecked. And then finally, you can turn away from faith. Look over in Matthew chapter 24. Faith can also, in addition to, to being wandered away from, shipwrecked, you can turn away from your faith. And we've seen people do this. Matthew 24, verse 7. Nations will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginnings of birth plan. Thanks. You know, there's so much going on in our world right now. I wonder if Jesus isn't close to coming back. Right. Amen, brother. Preach it. Verse 9, these. Then you will uh, be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. And you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many <coughs> will turn away from the faith. Wow. Brothers and sisters, it's not going to get easier for us. Yep. It's going to get harder. Yeah. There's a price to pay for evangelizing the world. Come on, bro. And that's why it's so important that we be family. Amen? Amen. You know, faith has to fight to break through walls. Yeah. A lot of you right now, like, like Joshua at Jericho, you've walked out and you look up and there's a big 15-foot wall standing right in front of your face. It might be the wall of your character. Things you've been trying to change for years. And it's, it's just a wall that you haven't been able to break through yet. It may be sin. It may be the circumstances that you're in. Uh, maybe it's past hurt. Something that you've gone through and you're just not, you've just not been able to get by it. Well, I suggest to you today that you put a by faith in front of whatever that is. Yeah. Turn over to Joshua, chapter 5. I'm almost done. Come on, Joshua. No, 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 Look at verse 13. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied. But as commander of the armies of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell down, face down, to the ground in reverence, and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you're standing is holy. Faith has to fight to break through some walls. And we learn right here that Joshua comes before the commander of the armies of God. A lot of scholars believe this is the, the incarnate, the anophic manifestation of Christ. I'm not necessarily ready to say that. It definitely is an angel, though. All right. 
And Joshua comes before him and, and, and the angel says, God wants to give you a message before God wants to give you a miracle. Wow. God wants to give you a message before God wants to give you a miracle. Amen, bro. Come on. That's deep. And here we find that Joshua has to stop and allow God to take charge. Are you with us? Or are you with our enemies? Neither. I'm with me. Come on. Wow. The question is, are you with me? Come on, brother. You know, there's a funny thing about rebellion. Oh. Because faith never grows in the heart of a rebel. Oh. Wow. Wow. Some of you wonder why your faith isn't growing. You're a rebel. Wow. Oh. 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 God says, it's not about me being with you. Are you with me? Let me give you a message before I give you a miracle. Come on, brother. Now bow down and worship. Yeah. Some of us are going out fighting battles and we haven't worshiped in days since Sunday, last Sunday. Oh, you have no business fighting if you haven't worshiped. I think secondly, God uses strange weapons. Have you ever noticed that about God? Yeah. All you gotta do is look in the mirror. <laughs> You're a strange True. weapon. Amen. <laughs> Preach right. that one. Come on, bro. You're unschooled ordinary. Yeah. Hey, I'm so happy. Proud of you. You want to change the world through this? God uses strange weapons. You know, I'm so excited about. Michael challenging us all to take the 40-day challenge. That means we're getting serious about doing great things in 2018. But it's not going to be easy. Michael's going to be walking by the pizza shop. Oh, it happened. It happened. Oh, boy. Welcome by the chicken shop. Oh, boy. Chicken shop. No Nando's. His new baptized son is going to have a nice big piece of chicken. Oh, man. Oh, man. Oh, man. He's going to be walking up and down the streets of London. <coughs> praying. Crying out to God. Amen. Amen. One of your most famous prime ministers of all time said that being the Prime Minister of, Brit of Britain is very lonely. Because mm -hmm. it's lonely at times when you have to make great decisions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that's right. cool. So what's the message? What, what was the message that the commander gave Joshua? I want to look at this because I think these are some principles that if we can put these into practice, they'll change our lives. All right, come on, John. Come on, bro, bro. Come on. The message is found in verse 3. He says, march around the city with all the armed men. He said, you, you start this battle by taking the men on a prayer walk. Wow. Oh. Have the men go on a prayer walk for seven days. And let me say something to the men. I'm sick of the women doing better than the men. All right. Oh. I'm sick of the single sisters not having viable husbands Ooh. that they can have in the future because there's not enough great single men. It's time for us as leaders to start challenging the men. Are the men in your ministry 
even worthy to lead the women and children. Take the men on a prayer walk around the city and get them spiritual. Number four, have the seven priests carry the trumpets and the ram horns in front of the ark. The ark is a symbol of God's presence. Number one, you've got to get the men praying and, and fasting. But then number two, you've got to get God in the battle. We've got to keep God with us. And then he says, blow the trumpet on the seventh day and on and on and on. And then Joshua takes this advice. He, he does exactly what the commander of the Lord's army says. But then he adds some things of his own in verse 10 that God didn't say. In verse 10, but Joshua had commanded the people, do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voices. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. Then shout. This was not God's instruction. This instruction came from Joshua. Joshua was the one who spoke up in the desert to try to save their mothers and fathers. Come on, come on. When they complained and they bickered and they argued and God got so sick of their complaining that he killed them right there in the desert. And Joshua was spared. Come on. So here he is now with their offspring. Come on, John. And they're about to take Jericho. And God says, you pray around this city, you march around this city, you keep me first in the battle, and you be quiet. No complaining. Complaining killed your mama and your daddy. Oh, boy. Shut up. Come on, bro. Some of us need to just stop talking. Come on, bro. Right. Come on. Come on. Joshua said, I don't want to take a chance on your mama and daddy's spirit coming out of you guys. We don't want no complaining while y'all are walking around these walls. And you can imagine if just one of them, Joshua had a lot of time. You know what, man, I don't know if all this walking is what we need to be doing. Now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, right? <laughs> Yeah, bro, you right, man. I mean, you right. Mike, Michael got us walking out here like this. And, and yeah, Michelle's got all the girls out here, too. And then, you know, there's a complaining, bitter spirit yes. can destroy the work of God. That's right. That's true. Well done. Joshua said, just be quiet. Let's go, bro. Come on, God performed an incredible miracle. Yep. You know, um, the Bible says that here that we, we've got to deal and silence our sinful nature. That, that's really what this is right here. Silence their sinful nature. You know, we came to London in 1995. I, 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 I'll, I'll never forget. You know, it's interesting. I, I talk about how the articles were written about me and how the, the day we had that first service and I, I saw the cynicism and I saw the critical spirit in the British people. Yeah. Yeah. And I, a part of my fast and my prayer, that's what God revealed to me. Don't you put up with any cynicalness. Amen. Don't you put up with any criticalness. Amen. Come on, brother. And we didn't. Right, James? Yeah. <laughs> What's the sinful nature? Not your sinful nature. What's the sinful nature of your city? What's the sinful nature of your church? You know, we just took over a ministry in, in Metro Heights. Woo! Yeah! Metro. And I went right in there on the men. You know, and I said, I don't even want to talk about the women. We got to turn, you got to turn around first. And I said, we will not replicate the sins of our community in our church. Wow. Come on, John. 
we will not tolerate immorality. We will not tolerate drugs. Black former gang members, you pull your pants up. You cannot have your pants down below your rear end in this ministry. around like that, go to the West. But you can <laughs> Corinthians chapter 5, or chapter 10, verse 4, write this down. The Bible says we demolish strongholds. The stronghold on London was cynicism and criticalness. We repented of that sin in the church, and anybody that came in the church repented of that sin. We loved the British people. I want to challenge you. I appreciate all the people of color in the London church. I'm a man of color. I'm proud to be a man of color. But we don't build churches of color. We build churches of Christ. Amen. I would trade any one of my brothers of color away for anything in the world. But our church has to look like our country. That's right, bro. Our church has to look like our city. Our church has to reflect our community. Where are the British oh, wow. in our church? Yep. You say, well, well, I'm British. <laughs> Amen. And I love you. <laughs> but do you speak the Queen's Sisters, uh, we, we need to become all things to all men. And we need to reach out to all people. Does our church, our church should not look like the, the ethnic restaurant down the street. Our church should look like the pharmacy or the grocery store, yeah. or the mall, yeah. where all people yeah. gather. Yeah. Yeah. Some of you feel like the Anglo-British aren't open. All people are open. Yeah. Come on, right? I appreciate it. You know, I, I've got a little Barack Obama in me. I was the first black leader to ever lead the London church. But we were a British church. We didn't make the London church an American church. It was a British church, and we were proud of it. So we demolish strongholds. Come on, John. What's the sinful nature that we need to demolish? You demolish the sinful nature, you put it by faith in front of it, and God will open the floodgates to your city. Amen, bro. I don't have time to do my second point. I'll send it to y'all later. <laughs> let, me just, let me just say this, though. Uh, you know, sometimes our faith can conquer a wall. It allows walls to fall. Sometimes our faith allows disciples to fall. Isaiah was sawed in two with a wooden saw. 
John the Baptist was beheaded. Stephen was stoned and, and cried out, Father, forgive them. They don't know what you're doing. You know, there's a really cheap watch in America called Timex. <laughs> Nobody should ever buy one. <laughs> but, you know, Timex, their, their advertising campaign is unbelievable. Their slogan is, if you know what, say it with me, you take a licking and you keep on ticking. No, I don't know that one. And that watch can't take a licking. No. But people keep buying it. But maybe our faith needs to adopt that campaign. It takes a licking. And it keeps on ticking. Come on. You know, this, this last year of my life, was one of the hardest years I'd ever experienced. Wow. Six months ago, um, not only was I, had I left the old ICLC movement, I, I had pretty much decided I, I was going to leave God. I decided I'd, I'd go to church on a Sunday and sit in the back row in obscurity in an old traditional Church of Christ with a lot of really, really old people. So nobody would notice me. <laughs> but I decided I was done. Wow. I I virtually lost my faith. Come on, John. I had nothing left. I didn't have the energy to preach. I didn't have the energy to speak. I didn't want to go to church anymore. And I started praying and studying David and the Psalms and 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 realized my heart had grown ice cold. I've been a part of a fellowship where I hadn't had any discipling for 14 years. I was overseeing in our former movement 10,000 disciples. That's twice the size of God's modern day movement. I remember preaching an Easter Sunday sermon in, in that, the April of that year. And, and I walked off stage and I, I just started crying. Because I had nothing left. Come on, girl. I had nothing left. And during that sabbatical, I, I realized, man, my heart is, is so cold because it started melting. And I started studying and I had to learn how to fall in love with Jesus all over. Come on, bro. It was the greatest time of my life. Just me and my God. I remember uh, about four and a half months into this time, God put it on my heart to get reconciled with anybody I hadn't been reconciled with. Mm -hmm. And I thought about kipping away. Come on, bro. Come on, John. Come on, John. You got this, bro. Come on. We love you. We love you, bro. Come on, John. Come on, bro. Somebody give me a name. Long the way, bro. <laughs> guys in London know I'll go sit down any minute. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I called up Kip and apologized. Because I judged him for 14 years. And Kip just threw open his arms. Amen. It was like we had never been apart. Right. Yeah. Be 
honest with you, I, I don't know where I would be if it wasn't for the ICC. Yeah. Yeah. There's no way I could have gone back to my old church because it was lukewarm. It wandered away from the faith that we started with. Did it become autonomous? There was no commitment to discipling. No true commitment to world evangelism in our generation. And if it wasn't for you guys, I would have had nowhere to go. Thank you all for saving yeah. my faith. In describing the apocryphal story of the second coming of Christ, on, traveling to what is now England, and Jesus establishing the New Jerusalem. The song we sang earlier, William Blake started the song in 1804, completed it in 1808. He said, and did those feet in ancient times walk upon England's mountain green and was the holy lamb of God on England's pleasant pasture scene. And did the countenance divine shine forth upon our clouded hills? And was Jerusalem builded here among these dark satanic hills? Bring me my bow of burning gold. Bring me my arrows of desire. Bring me my spear, O oh clouds unfold. Bring me my chariot of fire. I will not cease from the mental fight, nor shall my sword sleep deep in my hand. Till we built Jerusalem in England's green. Let's build God a great church.